we live so much in a world of change that we don't notice the changes in our own mind. Changes outside are so drastic sometimes, and so incessant, that the changes in our mind get shoved off into the background so we hardly notice them. It's when we come out to a quiet place like this, where not much happens in the course of the day, that you really got to see the mind jumping around. And in the beginning, it's pretty discouraging. You read the texts about how the ideal meditator brings, brings the mind to the present moment, settles down, has rapture, has pleasure, singleness of preoccupation. It looks easy in the text, but when you look at your own mind, there doesn't seem to be any comparison. So when you get discouraged like that, one of the themes the Buddha has you think about is called Sankha Anusati, recollecting the Sangha. Think of all the people who've practiced meditation over the past couple thousand of years. Not everybody had it easy. As the Buddha said, there are basically four types of practice, fast and easy, fast and painful, slow and easy, slow and painful. And you can't choose which type you're going to be. But there have been all four types all along. Even in the time of the Buddha, there were some people who found it really difficult, really painful, but they stuck with it. There are a couple cases of monks and nuns who got suicidal because their minds just, just wouldn't settle down. But even they were able to pull themselves together at some point. Here we are, here we are we're not yet suicidal. I hope. So if they could pull themselves together, we can pull ourselves together. A lot of it has to do with patience. We Americans are an impatient lot. Everything is instant, instant, instant. I remember when computers first came out, they seemed so fast. And then you just got faster and faster. Now you go back and you use an old computer, and it seems like you're just sitting there kind of chugging away. Very lazy. And we tend to expect that kind of speed in every aspect of our lives. So sometimes we have to face up to the fact that, okay, maybe our practice is going to be slow. But at least it's a practice. At least it's going someplace. As the Buddha once said, the, the sorrow that comes from having a goal you haven't reached yet is nowhere near as bad as the sorrow that comes from not having a goal. Psychologists tend to teach us that having ideals is, is hard on the mind. What kind of life would it be like if we didn't have ideals, if we didn't have a sense of direction? We'd just be floundering, or floundering around, and there'd be that question, where is this going? What is this all about? Because there is so much pain. There is so much suffering that goes on in this world. And if we don't make up our minds that, okay, at least we're going to head in the right direction, it all seems very hopeless. The right attitude it has of however long it takes, this is the path to follow. This is the only one that offers any real hope. And where can you start except for where you are? So you start where you are. You take heart from the fact that there have been people who've been worse off than you, and they've become arahants. Many, many, many people like this in the past. So try not to set a time limit on how quickly you want it to happen. Just make sure that your your compass is headed, the needle of your compass is headed in the right direction, and you just follow it. And if you fall down, you pick yourself up. Fall down again, pick yourself up again. Find ways of encouraging yourself. And John Mahabua tells a wonderful story about how he was out in the woods one time and feeling kind of miserable. He was all alone. Apparently he'd gotten to some sort of impasse in his practice. And he overheard some villagers. They're on their way to a, a festival in another village, and they sound like they're having so much fun. 
there for a moment he was thinking, my gosh, here I am just as rag thrown away in the forest. My life has no meaning at all. At least those people know, know enough how to have fun, how to have a good time. But then he was able to set his thoughts aright. He said, wait a minute, I'm being out here in the forest. I'm not sending myself to hell. At least I'm headed in the right direction. Their direction just goes around and around and around and goes nowhere. This direction has hope. This direction has purpose. And so it's this ability to talk yourself into sanity. That's what matters. And talking yourself into sanity once may not work, but you just keep doing it. Keep chipping away, chipping away, chipping away. This is an important part of the meditation. We often think meditation means not thinking, just focusing on the breath and coming back, coming back, coming back. But there are times when it just doesn't seem to work and you've got to sit down and encourage yourself. A good part of meditation is skillful thinking. How to think when you're angry, to get past the anger. How to think when you're feeling lost, how to get past the lust. How to think when you're feeling discouraged, so you can get back to past the discouragement or the depression or whatever. Before we can give up thinking, we have to learn how to think well. We have this wonderful faculty, this ability to think, and yet for so much of us it's destructive. It causes us all kinds of harm. It's like giving, giving a child an atomic bomb. If the child were really intelligent, it would use the atomic bomb for, say, some useful purpose. But most often it just wants to throw it around and get the Big Bang. That's the way it is with our thinking. The human mind can think a lot of wonderful things, and in particular can think its way into the path. When the Buddha's, say for the example, when the Buddha talks about past lives, future lives, the principle of karma, it's to focus our intention on what's really important right now, which is what the intentions we're thinking right now the intentions we're following through. He has many stories about sort of the cycles of the universe, past lives, future results, and present actions. And it seems to point away from the present, but actually it's pointing right back to the present. He always ends the stories by saying, okay, all this developments come out of karma. What is karma? It's the intentions in your mind, the things you're thinking right now. It's this amazing power we have, so learn how to use it properly. So many times we act when our intentions just kind of seem to force us to act without really thinking about it. So we want to stop and take, take note of them, be careful about them, watch them, get to know them. And to do that we have to realize their importance. So sometimes it requires sort of thinking our way into what, realizing why they are important. And the same goes with a lot of the other elements in the path as well. Sometimes the mind really gets off on the wrong track, and you've got to keep thinking, 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 and bring yourself back. This is why we have teachers, this is why we have good friends on the path, but ultimately you have to be your own best friend. Take yourself in hand and say, look. Things may not be so well right now, but if you let yourself get off on the wrong path, it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. At least head in the right direction and keep walking there as much as you can. And you find that step by step by step, things begin to clear up. Even if outside things don't clear up immediately, at least the mind is in a much better state. So when you find it hard to stay with the breath, there are lots of topics, meditation topics for getting yourself back on track. Recollection of the Sangha, recollection of the Dhamma, recollection of the Buddha, recollection of the good you've done in the past. These are all useful techniques. These are all a legitimate part of the meditation. We tend to forget that. Oftentimes we want just the technique. Some meditation teachers say, okay, all you need is a technique. They turn into the super science, they say. It has nothing to do with any cultural background, nothing to do with any 
any belief system at all, then what do you've got? Well, you've got a tool, but what are you going to use it for? There's a whole system of values that lies around the meditation. If, if just, say, pure vipassana, or pure noting, or pure whatever were enough, why would the path have eight folds to it? Why would it have eight parts? Part of it is right resolve. There's right view and right resolve. These things have to get straightened out in order to keep the path in line. As the Buddha once said, right view comes first. Right after that comes right resolve. So if you find your, your views getting off the path, go sit yourself down and reason things out. Learn how to use your thinking faculty wisely. When it's used really wisely, the Buddha says, okay, then you then you can get the mind to settle down in concentration and the thinking becomes less and less and less necessary. But as with so many aspects of the path, you can't really let go of them until you've mastered them. So if your meditation requires just sitting here and thinking for a while, okay, that's it's a legitimate part of the practice. And you find that you get better and better at working through some of the arguments the mind has for straying off the path, or attitudes that prevent it from getting on the path. They get weaker and weaker, and you can see through them more and more easily. Then you find yourself more and more proficient at getting to the present moment and staying there. Not simply through forcing the mind, but because the mind understands this is the best place to be. Then you can really get down to work.